character. We are in a series here, I've entitled it Dynamic Doctrine. It's a topical series. It's actually uh, adapted from the ABCs that we use here, somewhat revised. But uh, what we are looking at is important doctrines. Of course, it's taken from the Word of God, which is the only legitimate source of doctrine. We go to the Bible to find out what God says. And these things are written, it says, so that ye may know, so that ye might know. It says that over and over and over again. Well, last time we looked at the Bible itself as we laid the foundation. And today, part two, we'll move on as we talk about God the Father. And here in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice you're only four words into the Bible when you're introduced to God. And it doesn't waste any time expounding upon who we're talking about here. It just says, in the beginning, God. And it went from there. Now, it's talking here about God as we know Him to be the Father. And the question is, who is God? Who is God? What is God like? How can we know about Him? I don't know if you've noticed it, but we have in our society today an all-purpose God, a generic God, a non-threatening God. He's the God that you hear about at swearing-in ceremonies as they invoke His blessings at a presidential inauguration or things like that. And they talk about God at these opening civic activities and things like Memorial Day ceremonies where they pray to God, quote-unquote. Of course, Jesus Christ isn't mentioned at all. Uh, no mention of God the Creator here, but just this generic God who's non-intimidating. He is non-threatening. He does not rebuke. He does not ask anything of you. He cannot admonish. He has no teeth even, what to, so to speak of. He's, he's just a, a pleasant God that keeps everybody comfortable. And so at the National Democratic Convention, they can open their convention by invoking this generic God, this this all-around purpose God who's harmless, and, and somebody can get up, a reverend can pray to him, a father can pray to him, a rabbi can pray to him, a swami can pray to him. Anyone can really pray to him because there's no theology with this particular God. He's not offensive to believers and unbelievers alike. And uh, you can even pray to this God and ask his blessings before a gay pride parade, and he'll be okay with that. You can address him as he or she or or it or whatever because he's totally non-divisive, this God. Oh, and forget about the Ten Commandments on tablets of granite. The, 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 the all-purpose God has no rules whatsoever. And so you don't have to worry about those kind of things. He is accommodating. Now, have you noticed him all over our society? Have you heard him prayed to throughout these things I've been talking about? He's all over the place. He is actually a violation of the second commandment, making a God of our own imagination. And that's really what our society has done. But that's the kind of God who for 20 years I knew. You know, the, the big man upstairs, the man in the sky, you know. And for 20 years I was in a fog about God. I, I really didn't understand God. The fact that He created everything. I heard it evolved. I heard of, of uh, uh, that it kind of evolved and He created it both. And I didn't know where it come from. I didn't know why I was here. Didn't know where I was going when it was all said and done. You know, to me, God was just a non-threatening God that's out there. And, oh, that's kind of nice. They prayed a prayer to God before that particular ceremony. And whatever you want to believe doesn't matter. I mean, we're all kind of trying to get to the same place. And, and uh, the God of the Muslims is the God of the Christians and the God of the Jews. And, and He's just this particular God. There's, there's no absolutes, right? And so, really, who cares? That was what I thought for many years until I got saved. And then I met the one true God. I placed my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And I received Him as my Lord and Savior. And now He resides within me. But again, I beg the question, who is God? Who is God? Well, the Bible doesn't even spend any time arguing about the fact there is a God to begin with. It just starts out in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. doesn't even argue about the fact there is a God. Should we, by the way? Think about it. We waste an awful lot of time trying to prove there's a God when He doesn't even waste any time trying to prove that He exists. The fact He exists is absolutely obvious here. It's, it's, it's taken for granted. The Bible says in Psalm 19.1 that the heavens declare the glory of God. We have a sun today that's 93 million miles away from us. 
If it was any less, we'd be incinerated. If it was any further away, we'd be frozen. We have a moon that's 250,000 miles away from us. It's just perfect. And it, it, it does everything that needs to do with gravitational pull and tides and all that kind of thing. We have an earth that's, that's tilted at its axis 23 degrees and, and uh, spins like a rotisserie, just perfectly keeping this even heat throughout. We could talk about the air. Boy, it's a lucky thing that there's air because that's the very thing we need as humans to breathe, right? And boy, what a lucky thing that we have old H2O because we'd, ex- we would cease to exist without water. We would talk about the human being, the head, the arms, the hands, the feet. The eye itself, which is an incredible miracle. And the Bible says we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made and it's a statistical impossibility to say that we evolved. There's absolutely no case for it whatsoever. We are intelligent and uh, the fact of the matter is we choose to either believe in a God or not to believe in a God, but there's no such thing as believers and non-believers. A non-believer would look at us and say, well, you guys just have faith. Well, they have faith as well. And they made a choice as well. And they believe as well. An evolutionist comes along and says, prove that there's a God. And I say, I can't. And they say, ha, gotcha. You've chosen to believe there is one. I say, that's right. I turn around and I say, prove to me there is no God. And they say, well, I can't do that. I say, that's right. They say, but I believe there's no God. And I say, yes, you've chosen to believe, haven't you? We've both chosen to believe something. It's just the fact of the matter is, it makes more sense. In fact, it takes way more faith to believe there's no God than faith to believe there is God. And it makes way more sense to believe that there is a God out there. And I have the external witness of God all around me, as well as the internal witness of God within me. I know that there's a God. There's no question about that whatsoever. In fact, a child knows that there's a God. You've got to mess up a kid to get them not to believe in God. The fact of the matter is, it's innate. They're born with it. They know there's a God. I heard about a grandpa, an old man. He he didn't believe in God. He was a he was a just a die in the wool atheist. And he took his grandson aside and he lectured him for nearly an hour, convincing him that there was no God. And by the time he was done, the little boy said, "Okay, grandpa, I believe you, but do you think God's offended that we don't believe in Him?" It's <laughs> the bottom line. I mean, it's born in a kid. But society messes that up along the way. Well, the fact of the matter is the Bible wastes no ink on the atheist, the one who doesn't believe in God. I take that back. It, it devotes half a verse to that man. In Psalm 14, 1, it says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And that's it. That's all God has to say. Half a verse devoted to the atheist who says there is no God. The fact of the matter is, it it just opens here in Genesis 1-1 by saying, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Plain and simple. And so we're introduced to God here. And we'll talk about the word used for God in this verse in a little bit. But look in Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11. God's chosen method is faith. God says, if you're going to believe in me, you have the choice. You can either believe, you can either not believe. It requires faith. And the Bible says that the just shall walk by faith. And the Bible even says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And here's another gem in Hebrews chapter 11. It is a dandy. Notice in Hebrews 11 and in verse number 6, the Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now notice, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God, theos, must believe that he is. And that's where it all starts. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now as we talk about God the Father today, we look at, we're going to look at several things here. And first of all, it begs the question, who made God? Who made God, because everything must have a maker, right? This microphone I'm holding right here didn't just happen. It had a maker. This pulpit that I'm standing behind right now had a maker. That church pew that you are sitting on right now, it had a maker. That carpet your feet are resting on right now, it had a maker. Everything must have a maker. So who made God? Well, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 33, And verse 27, if you're taking notes, that the eternal God is thy refuge. The eternal God is thy refuge. You say, Pastor, I didn't see it there. Uh, I'm still wondering, who made God? Well, think about the word eternal. The eternal God 
is thy refuge. If something is eternal, it's always been around, right? It, it, it never had any beginning. It's always been. We can't fathom that. We cannot fathom a universe without walls that just keeps on going forever and ever and ever and never stops. And we can't even fathom time in the past that never had a beginning or time in the future that will never have an end. It's beyond our comprehension. We can't figure it out. But the Bible says the eternal God is thy refuge. And by that it means God has always been around before there was nothing. God was actually there. And by the way, that's the reason the evolutionists cannot disprove the existence of God. He or she wasn't there. Nobody was there. Nobody was around. Many years ago, Dr. Richard Hayes was in an airport waiting for a plane. And a fellow sat down next to him, well-dressed. They got to talking and found out this fellow was very well-off and important, things like that. Brother Hayes said, I'm a Christian counselor. The other fellow said, well, that's interesting. I... I'm an atheist. Brother Hayes said, oh, you're an atheist. He, he said, really? He said, well, tell me something. Do you know everything there is to know? And the fellow kind of chuckled. He said, well, of course not. Brother Hayes said, do you know half of everything there is to know? And the fellow chuckled again. He said, well, of course I don't know half of everything there is to know. And Brother Hayes said, well, do you suppose that God exists in the half that you don't know about? <laughs> And the guy laughed. He said, you got me there. And Brother Hayes chuckled. He said, yeah, you're not an atheist. He said, you're an agnostic. You just don't know, do you? And the guy said, well, no, you're right. I just don't know. They had a very nice conversation. And the fellow got a pretty changed in his theology by the time they were done. But the fact of the matter is, we don't even know 1% of all there is to know. And so maybe God's in that percent. We don't know. I do know this. God's always been around. He is eternal according to the Bible. Look in Hebrews 9, just a page back from where you're at. In Hebrews 9 and in verse number 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God. Now let's just stop there. All I want you to get is eternal Spirit. And by the way, God is Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in Spirit and truth, according to Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about the eternal Spirit. God is eternal. He's always been around. So the question is, who made God? Nobody. He's eternal. He's always been around. Secondly, how do we know there is a God? How do we know there is a God? Well, I alluded to a few things a moment ago, but let me give you four things here. Turn back to Romans, if you would, chapter 2. How do we know there is a God? Well, number one, the fact of the universal belief, as I call it, a universal belief in every society, in every civilization, at every age, amongst any people group, they have within them, born in them, a universal belief in God. It is in the human heart. I mentioned the fact that a child starts out with a belief in God. It's society that corrupts people along the way as they age. Man has a religious nature. By the way, we didn't come from animals. Animals don't have that. Animals do not have the inner knowledge of God and a, a desire to worship Him. Uh, you, can, you can think you're king of the monkeys if you want, but the fact of the matter is, animals don't have any desire to worship their Creator. But man always has. All men of all ages have always had a desire to worship God. Now, we picture man as some kind of a, a caveman, you know, uh, evolving back with, a, with a, a mammoth fur on and a club in his hand and some Neanderthal guy that looks like Frank. Uh, no, not, not really, but, but some guy that, you know, this is what we came from. We didn't come from that. They'll take the tooth of some, uh, some guy they found in a cave and construct this caveman out of him and, and say, this is what we used to look like. Baloney. But the fact of the matter is, there have always been people throughout ages who've resided in caves. And they have found scratching on the wall of, of, of past civilizations, thousands of years old, and, and a knowledge of God in their culture, a religion within their culture. You know, you look at Babylon even. You say, man, Nebuchadnezzar was such a heathen. No, they weren't heathen. They weren't non-believers. They had lots of gods. They worshipped Baal and so on. Even even wicked civilizations, the, the Medo-Persians, the, the Greeks. Remember on Mars Hill and, and the Apostle Paul? They had thousands of gods. I mean, the Romans and, and total pagans, they've always worshipped something because it's in the human heart to worship. It, God's put it there. And so there's this universal belief in, in some higher being, some God. Every civilization has had it. There's a bestseller out right now that, that the, the author boasts that if you pick it up and read it as a believer, you'll put it down as an atheist. 
And they asked him, all right, you don't believe there's a God. What about the universal belief in God? And I had to laugh at his answer because it was such circular reasoning. He can't explain that away. God has put within the human heart a belief that there is a God. Now notice here in Romans 2 and in verse number 14. It says, for when the Gentiles, that's unbelievers, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. In other words, they know. They don't even have to have the Ten Commandments right now. They know it's wrong to kill and so on. It says, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now, man has a conscience. And you come along and you say, well, that's something animals don't have. Well, animals even have that. I, I'm, our dog can act up. He, know, he knows he's messing up. But the fact of the matter is, a dog doesn't have a spirit. And, and only man has the law of God written in his heart. As it mentions here, he knows. In fact, they have found civilizations and caves and places like that who had no knowledge of the Bible at all. I mean, total pagan heathen, but somehow... They knew that there was a God, but that's not all. They knew He was a Father. They knew He had a Son. Now you tell me how they knew that. Nobody ever told them, but they knew that God was a Father who had a Son. Somehow they knew that. God placed that within their hearts. And so, how do we know there's a God? Well, number one, the fact of the universal belief. Number two, what I call the cause and effect factor. Now, here's what I mean by that. By cause and effect, I mean that, okay, man is uh, is the cause of somebody. Uh, we have intelligence, so who made us who has intelligence? We didn't just come along. We have personality. Somebody had to make us who has personality. It's the cause and the effect thing. That's the bottom line. Thirdly, I believe there's a God because of intricate design in the universe. Everywhere we look around us, and I talked about it already, everywhere we look, there's intricate design. Now, hold your finger here, but look back in Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, stay in Romans for a moment here. You know, I was just down in the uh, the Texas Gulf here a few weeks ago and uh, was watching the tide come in and go out. It'd do so every uh, twice a day, every day. It would come up to a certain point and go back down. And at night you could look up and you could see the moon and, and realize the cause there of that. And a God who has this intricate design that uses that as a washing effect to keep the oceans of the world clean. There are so many things we could talk about. I was listening to Kitty Radio yesterday uh, for about 10 minutes and heard about the uh, the green heron. Not the great blue heron, but the green heron and, and how he is green because he sits on the, in the marshes there and he needs to camouflage when he's hunting for food. He'll, he'll uh, take a grasshopper in his mouth. He'll wait till he sees about a four inch trout swimming down in the water and he has a way of spitting it right in front of that, that four inch trout and he has a way of timing it when exactly that trout comes up for that grasshopper. Wham! He hits that trout and he, he takes it and he throws it up in the air so that it comes in head first. If it didn't, imagine what the fins of that trout would do. It's got to go in head first. Now, who taught him to do that? Nobody. He knows how to do that. God put it within him. You know, there are things, whether fish or fowl or mammals, that, that uh, they, they'll mate in a certain part of the world and then they'll swim or fly thousands of miles away, give birth, die, and the offspring, the baby, will, will swim or fly right back to the place where mom and dad met and find their mate, and nobody's ever taken them on that trip, but they know where to go. You tell me, how do they know that? God, I mean, I would stand here for hours. God has built all that and designed all that into his creation, and the fact that there's intricate design in the universe, it tells me there's a God. Now, notice here, it talks a little bit about these things, but the psalmist, he zeroes in on the human being in Psalm 139. And he says in verse 14, I will praise thee, talking to God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Kind of sounded like a southerner, old David, there for a second. But he said, and that my soul knoweth right well. Notice, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully 
made. You know, we talked about so many things. The fact that God told man to be fruitful and multiply and, and reproduce and how babies come into the world. And it's, it's just a miracle. It really is. There's intricate design in the universe. For the first 20 years of my life, I wasn't thinking. I mean, imagine now to look around and, and see it. It's so obvious. But beforehand, it, duh, you know, there is a God out there who designed all this. And so we have no excuse. In fact, back in Romans again, chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1, notice what the Bible says in verse 20. It says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We have no excuse. God's given all kinds of evidence about Himself. There's a fourth way that we can know there's a God, and that's what I call the events of history. The events of history, if we are thinking people, we realize that history is His story. It's God unfolding His big plan. We are studying Daniel chapter 11 in, in the Master's Baptist College this last week. And uh, we just went through verse after verse and, and things that were written hundreds of years before they happened. But God describing uh, women like Bernice and Cleopatra and Antiochus and, and uh, Ptolemies and Seleucids and all these guys. I mean, if, if, if we had the time, we've, we've studied it here before. And I told the, the class, I said, don't even bother memorizing it. It's just this whole host of information. But it's so impressive because it shows you not only, number one, the credibility of, of the Word of God, but number two, how God is in control over history. And God sets down a one and puts up another. In fact, turn to Psalm 75, if you would, back into the Psalms. We could talk about the arrival of Christ on the scene and how God foretold when it was going to happen, how God foretold that there would be a Babylon, and after Babylon, the Medo-Persians, and after the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, and after the Grecians, the Romans, and the demise of Rome, and, and what is even coming. But God is in control of history. And notice here in Psalm 75, and in verse number 6, it says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. In other words, He is in control. And so we look at history. Now, we've said, number one, who made God? We've said, number two, how do we know there is a God? Number three, let's ask this question. How many gods are there? I mean, if we knew absolutely nothing about God, that'd be a good question, wouldn't it? How many gods are there? Well, look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would. You know, even in uh, a place like Greece, Athens, you know, the, the modern day source of culture and, and uh, education and philosophy from the time of the Apostle Paul, and yet they were clueless on how many gods there were. When Paul walked through the city, he said, I, you guys are really religious. He said, I've seen thousands of monuments erected to various gods. And, and he said, let me tell you about the one true God, the one you said you don't know over here. That's the one I want to expound to you. How many gods are there? Well, notice in Deuteronomy 6, this was basic bonehead theology 101 for the Jewish children because this was the verse they memorized. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. You say, well, but pastor, I'm confused because... Well, you read things like the Great Commission, go into the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It, it just sounds to me like there's more than one God here. Well, look in 1 John chapter 5. I'll show you an even more puzzling verse than that one. How many gods are there? Good question. In 1 John 5 and in verse number 7, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. If you just stopped right there, they'd say, okay, we got three gods. No, read the rest of the verse. And these three are one. And these three are one. All right, we're talking about one God. So what we read back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is accurate. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So there's only one God, but He's made up of three persons. Now, this is a mystery you can kind of understand it a little bit if you just look at something like water, H2O. It can exist in a liquid form, or you can heat it up and it exists in a, a vapor, a steam form, an invisible form, or you could take it outside and, and freeze it and, and uh, it would become a solid form, and yet it's all water, isn't it? Now, that's a, that's a poor comparison. Really, it is, because the bottom line is we're not going to begin to comprehend God, and I'm glad we can't. 
I'm glad He's far above my comprehension. I'm glad I have a God that's not on my level that I cannot understand. But once again, I accept by faith. And so we're talking one God. Now, brings us to the fourth question. All right, what is God then? What is God? Well, the Bible tells us, and I quoted a moment ago in John 424 that God is spirit. And that means we can't see him. It means he's in this room right now. He's invisible. But I can't physically touch him with my hand. I can't smell him. I can't really experience him with my five senses at all because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But that's not all. What is God? Well, notice here in 1 John again, chapter 4, cross the page in verse 8. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. There it is. We have another thing that God is not only spirit, but He is love. He doesn't just uh, contain love or have love, but He's the source of love. He is love. This world would know no love. This universe would know no love if it weren't for God. All all love comes from God. He is the source. He is the delta. He is He is the place where we get love. But that's not all. Notice here in 1 John 1, just a page back, what is God? Well, notice in verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. By the way, sometime when you have time, go back to Genesis 1 and study the creation. You'll notice that there is light in the creation before there was ever a sun, stars, moon, or anything that illuminates. Because God is light. God is the source of light. And uh, I'm so glad for that because it says in Him is no darkness at all. You ever thought about this? The one who's in total control of everything could be evil. He could be dark. I mean, it could have worked out that way. I, I We get real deep into it. But the fact of the matter is, the one who is in control of everything is light. He is good. Uh, he is, he is, he is, he is, uh, he is holy. We talk about so many other things here. And so I'm glad to know that. You know, we find back in Psalm 139, you need not turn there, but, uh, we find out that God is also all-knowing. Uh, in first, or I'm, I'm sorry, Psalm 139 and verse 1, the psalmist says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. He goes on, he talks about him being all around and the fact he is knowing everything. God is all knowing, which ought to sober us, shouldn't it? He knows what's going on in our lives. Look here in First John again, chapter 3 and in verse 20. It says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And so what is God like? Well, he's all knowing. He is all powerful. He is a spirit. He is good. Uh, he could have been evil, but he's not. But he does punish evil. In fact, Hebrews 12 verse 29 says our God is a consuming fire. Now, we could talk about a lot of things that personify God. They describe him and they help us to understand him. But the fact of the matter is we were created in his image. So the emotions we have, we got from God. The personality that we have, we got from God. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. The only way that we could love is because we are like God, made in His image. God also hates as well as loves. In uh, Proverbs 6, it mentions six things that God hates. A seven are an abomination to Him. God is not all love or only love. He hates as well. And so there are some things that we ought to hate. Do you hate abortion this morning? Do you hate the dismemberment and the tearing apart of children? I mean, there are some things going on in our nation that we ought to loathe. We ought to hate them because God hates them. There are some things we ought to love because God loves. But that's not all. As we read about God, we find out that He can also be grieved. You ever been grieved by something or someone? Back in Noah's day in Genesis 6, we find out God looks down and sees the condition of His creation and the Bible says it grieved Him in His heart. We also find out in Deuteronomy 6.15 that God is jealous. You say, is it okay to be jealous? In certain areas, it is good to be jealous. I'm jealous of my wife. I'm I'm not about to share her with with every other man in town. I I have a jealousy over her, and it's a godly jealousy. And and God is a jealous God in a good way. We find out in 1 Kings 11, verse 9, that God also gets angry. 
Uh, Solomon started out so good and then went so sour, and God saw what he was doing, and it made him angry. And he was right in being angry. Psalm 711 says God is angry with the wicked every day. Every day. So don't get this picture of God as some some Santa Claus or some grandpa that you just climb up in his lap and he's always loving, always gushing, and everything's okay. There are some things God hates and some things that make God angry that we read about. Now, on the other hand, we find out that God cares. We find in 1 Peter 5, 7 that He careth for you. And so we have a God with personality. And we say, well, what is He like? Well, do you care about certain people and certain things? I hope you do. Uh, he's like us and we're like Him because we were made in His image. He's personable. You know, the God of Islam, the so-called Allah, which is actually a moon god, is very impersonal. Uh, personable. And, and, and those in Islam know they can't approach him. He's too distant. He's too standoffish. Uh, he's untouchable. He, he has his arms folded and he's angry with uh, the, his followers. And, and listen, that's not the God of the Bible at all. We were made in his image and he is personable and he is real. I've been to Thailand. I've been into the Buddhist temple. I've seen the ultimate Buddha. I don't know what they call him there, but he's the, the, the supreme Buddha of, of, of uh, Thailand there in Bangkok. And uh, they lay food out for him, the statue. They change his clothes with the seasons to accommodate the weather. And they do all these other things for him. And I think to myself, you know, he's a, he's a false god, a god of wood or stone or, or iron and, and not personable at all. That's not God. The God of the Bible is personable. He's not some impersonal force. And so we say, what is God? Well, he's all these things. Uh, let's, let's ask fifthly, what is God like? What is God like? Well, He is all-knowing. We've talked about that already. Secondly, He is all-powerful. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus, no less, said, With God, all things are possible. Thirdly, God is everywhere. And uh, that often gets overlooked. People say, Pastor, how can I behave? And how can I overcome some temptation? You know, one of the greatest things that we could do is remember the omnipresence of God. I mean, it sober us up. If we remembered He's in the room with us, He's in the car with us, He's in the house with us, He's He's in here with us, if you're off gossiping in a corner, whatever it might be, God's there. And it would really sober us up and shape us up. Uh, we read in Psalm 139 and in verse 7, the psalmist says, "...whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence?" If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. goes on to say the darkness can't cover me. Nothing can get us away from God's presence because God is omnipresent. But that's not all. Fourthly, God is eternal. God is eternal. In Exodus 3.14, he told Moses, I am that I am. I am the I am. That's what he's saying there. And you say, well, what did he mean by that? Well, he didn't say I was or I will be, but he said I, I am. And the fact of the matter is he had no beginning, he'll have no end, and that's all he can be, the I am. Fifthly, we find he is unchangeable. If we had more time, we'd turn to Malachi 3 and verse 6 where he says, I change not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why change perfection? If something's perfect and you change it, what happens? It's no longer perfect anymore. It is something less. Now, we also find out that God is holy. In Psalm 99, verse 9, easy to remember, he speaks of his holiness. Uh, God is full of, number seven, mercy and grace. And you and I would not be here today as born-again Christians if it weren't for the grace of God. For by grace are you saved. If God judged according to what we deserve, none of us would go to heaven. But God is full of grace and God is full of mercy. We're saved by these. We're kept by these. Now, number eight, what is God like? Well, God is truth. The Bible says in Him is no darkness at all. Satan is a liar. Our nation is following lies today, one after the other. But God is truth. And God can only function within truth. And Titus 1, 2 tells us that God cannot lie. And so we've seen all these things about God, but finally and quickly, what is God called? What do we call Him? Well, in the beginning, God, that's the Hebrew word Elohim. Wherever you find an E-L there in the Hebrew language, whether Elijah or at the end of Joel, or wherever you find E-L, you find it's a name for God. And Elohim has an H-I-M at the end, which denotes plurality. In other words, the very first verse of the Bible tells us God's eternity. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. 
And so that's one of his titles. We can call him that. It means greatness. Now, another title for God in the Bible is Lord, where it's L-O-R-D in small caps, capital L, but O-R-D or in small caps. That's the word Adonai. And uh, that simply means master. Now, thirdly, we find the word Lord in all caps, L-O-R-D, and that's the word Jehovah. And that's simply meaning the Lord who is self-existent. In other words, we've talked about that. Nobody had to create him. He's self-existent, and he also yet reveals himself. Now, we're out of time here, but let me just say this. For, uh, for, for 20 years, I had this semi-scriptural, semi-unscriptural knowledge of God, one I described at the beginning. And uh, the fact of the matter is, all I had was a head knowledge of God, when He can be very real to you. This world doesn't know Him, but He reveals Himself through the Word, a word of God. Now, if we were to talk about all that we could about God, well, the world itself couldn't contain the books that ought to be written about Him. We've just scratched the surface barely today. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't know Him as Lord and Savior, He's reaching out to you, as He was to me for uh, 20 years plus reaching out to you and wants you to know Him and love Him and wants to reside within you if you have never been saved. What a blessing it is to be saved and have an eternal Heavenly Father who is our Creator, our Sustainer, and our God.